God bless the great state of California. It is such a privilege to be with you. California has given extraordinary things to the United States of America. California gave us the greatest leader of the modern era, Ronald Wilson Reagan. And far more selfishly in my own family, California gave me my wife and best friend, Heidi Suzanne Cruz. You know, I have to say this has been a remarkable week. Governor Wilson, thank you for that incredible support. Thank you for your strong leadership fighting to strengthen the American military, to protect our national security, to keep us th safe from threats abroad. Thank you for your leadership to secure the border and protect us from law enforcement and national security threats, to protect jobs here in California. And thank you for your generous and incredibly impactful support. Yesterday, I was privileged to receive the support of Governor Mike Pence in the state of Indiana, another strong, principled conservative. And then earlier this week, I was thrilled to announce my nominee for Vice President, Carly Fiorina. Carly is a remarkable leader known to you well. She started as a secretary and climbed the corporate ladder to become the CEO of the largest technology company in the world, the first woman CEO of a Fortune 20 company in history. Carly is someone who has knowledge, who has judgment, and who has character. That's what I was looking for, the most serious determination that any leader makes, any presidential candidate makes, is naming his or her vice president as someone who's prepared to step in at a moment's notice and preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution, honor the promises made to the American people, and be commander-in-chief and keep this country safe. You need someone knowledgeable who understands the domestic economy, understands where jobs come from. You need someone with good judgment that is sober and stable and level-headed and not likely to make rash and hot-headed decisions, not likely to explode at the latest Twitter storm. And you need someone with character, someone with character to tell you the truth, someone who knows what they believe. Someone who actually believes something. And someone who understands what it's like to struggle. One of the things that impresses me about Carly is she has shattered glass ceilings her entire life. She knows the struggle. And she's prepared to fight for us. And I got to tell you, Carly terrifies Hillary Clinton. You know, I can just picture Hillary thinking about Carly, tossing and turning, and tossing and turning in her jail cell. <laughs> this election is going to come down to three critical issues, jobs, freedom, and security. My number one priority as president will be jobs and economic growth, bringing jobs back to America. What Ronald Reagan understood and what JFK understood before him is that when you cut taxes and you reduce regulations on small businesses, the result is millions upon millions of new high-paying jobs. I intend to follow the path blazed by Reagan and JFK and lift the boot of the federal government off the back of the necks of small businesses. If I'm elected president, we will repeal every word of Obamacare. We'll pass common sense health care reform that makes health insurance personal and portable and affordable and keeps government from getting in between us and our doctors. And we will pass a simple flat tax. 
where every one of us can fill out our taxes on a postcard. And when we do that, we should abolish the IRS. And we're going to rein in the EPA and the federal regulators who have descended like locusts on farmers and ranchers and small businesses killing jobs all across this country. Listen, as Republicans in California, y'all are a hearty bunch. You are used to adversity. And you have seen firsthand the absolute disaster, the absolute train wreck that is out-of-control liberalism. You don't need to look any further than out-of-control environmental policies that have resulted in, since 2008, 1.4 trillion gallons of fresh water being dumped into the Pacific Ocean because of a little three-inch bait fish. Now, I'm sure it will drive our friends in the media crazy when I observe that, in my experience, three-inch fish go great with cheese and crackers. But as a result of those policies, 1.4 trillion gallons of fresh water could provide for over 6 million Californians for six years. Over 17,000 farm jobs have been lost. Mar migrant farm workers, Hispanic workers have been thrown out of work because of the misguided regulations. And you know what the people here understand? We can have a win-win scenario. We can actually protect the environment and protect jobs. For example, with endangered species. The Endangered Species Act shouldn't be used as a cudgel to kill economic development. Instead, it should have a provision for mitigation that if you increase the population of the endangered species that you can go forward with the development. So, for example, with the Delta smelt. If you increase the population through fisheries, 20%, 30%, you ought to be able to go with sending that water on to the, to the farms and ranches and Californians who need it. That's a win-win. Right now, when you list a species as an endangered species, almost inevitably the species goes extinct because all the economic incentives are to get rid of the darn thing. Instead, let's create an incentive to grow the population. You know, look, you take the little fish, you put up a disco ball, you play some Barry White. You let nature take its course. And that can be a win-win with a lot more of the fish and a lot more people having jobs. And as president... We are going to stop amnesty and end illegal immigration and end sanctuary cities and end welfare benefits for those here illegally. And the effect of all of that is we're going to see millions and millions of new high-paying jobs coming back to America. We're going to see jobs coming back from China, coming back from Mexico. We're going to see manufacturing jobs coming back to America. We're going to see wages rising once again. And we're going to see young people. Imagine you're at home and you get a call from your son or daughter. And they say, Mom, guess what? I got a job. Or even better, I've got two, three, four, five job offers. I don't even know which one to take. That's what this election is about. You want to sum it up very, very simply, a meme we put out online. Reaganomics. You start a business in your parents' garage. Obamanomics. You move into your parents' garage. <laughs> The Republican Party is and should be the party of jobs for hardworking Americans. That's my number one priority as president. The second critical issue in this election is freedom. 
with the passing of Justice Scalia, it underscored it's not just one. It's two branches of government that hang in the balance. Governor Wilson was powerful and eloquent on that threat. If you value religious liberty, the right of every one of us to, to live according to our faith and our conscience, whatever our faith might be, the right of every one of us to seek out and worship God free of government getting in the way. If you value the Second Amendment, the right to keep and bear arms and to protect our families and our homes, then those rights in every one of the Bill of Rights is one liberal justice away from being stripped from the American people. This next election will determine the course of the Supreme Court for a generation. And I give you my word that every justice I will appoint will be a principled constitutionalist and I will not compromise away your religious liberty and I will not compromise away your Second Amendment right to keep and bear arms. And in the very first days in office, I will instruct the U.S. Department of Education that Common Core ends today. The third critical issue in this election is security. For seven years, we've seen a president who abandons and alienates our friends and allies and shows weakness and appeasement to our enemies. You know, two debates ago, Donald Trump explained to all of us that if he were president, he would be neutral between Israel and the Palestinians. Well, let me be very clear. As president, I will not be neutral. America will stand unapologetically with the nation of Israel. And anyone who can't tell the difference between our friends and our enemies, between Israel and Islamic terrorists who want to kill us, that raises real questions about their fitness and judgment to be commander-in-chief. For seven years, we've seen our military weakened, readiness undermined. And, you know, as a nation, this is not the first time. We've seen this before. Another liberal left-wing Democrat, Jimmy Carter who weakened and undermined the military. And then in January 1981, Ronald Reagan came into office. And what did Reagan do? He cut taxes. He lifted regulations. We saw millions and millions of new high-paying jobs that generated trillions in new government revenue, and he used that revenue to rebuild our military, to bankrupt the Soviet Union, and to win the Cold War. I intend to do the exact same thing with radical Islamic terrorism. We're going to repeal Obamacare, pass a flat tax, rein in the regulators, stop amnesty. That's going to generate millions of new high-paying jobs, raising wages for working men and women. That, in turn, will generate trillions in new revenue for the federal government, and we will use that revenue to rebuild our military so that it remains the mightiest fighting force on the face of the planet. California has seen firsthand the face of evil that is jihad in San Bernardino. And we've seen a weakless and feckless president that goes on television, refuses to say the words radical Islamic terrorism, and instead lectures Americans on Islamophobia. Well, let me say to every jihadist on the face of the earth, to Al-Qaeda, to ISIS, to anyone who has waged war and intends to murder American citizens, a day of reckoning is coming. We will have a president whose single-minded focus is on defeating ISIS, defeating radical Islamic terrorism, and keeping the people of America safe and secure in our homes. And one of the saddest aspects of the last seven years has been watching this president send our fighting men and women into combat with rules of engagement so strict that their arms are tied behind their backs, that they cannot fight, they cannot win, they cannot defeat the enemy. 
That is wrong. It is immoral. And mark my words, in January 2017, it will end. <laughs> to every soldier and sailor and airman and marine, and for that matter, to every police officer and firefighter and first responder, the days of the president who does not respect your service are coming to an end. You will once again have the thanks of a grateful nation and a commander-in-chief who's got your back. So California is at a crossroads. California is going to decide this Republican primary. <laughs> Who'd have thunk it? <laughs> year after year, y'all are used to being treated by Republicans like an ATM <laughs> to take your money and spend it in other states. Well, I can tell you right now, we're going to spend more money in California than we raise in California. But for any of you who have your checkbooks handy, I would be glad for you to prove me wrong on that. <laughs> we are all in. We are going to be competing for all 172 delegates in California and all 53 congressional districts. It is going to be a battle on the ground, district by district by district. And, you know, some people have asked, why did you name Carly so early? It's unusual to name your vice presidential candidate this early. It's a very good answer. And I'll tell you, Carly will also be the first Californian on a national ticket since Ronald Reagan. But the reason I named her this week is that I believe the people of California and the people of this country deserve a clear and simple choice. Elections are about choices, and I think the contrast could not be clearer between Carly and me on the one side, a positive, optimistic, forward-looking, conservative campaign based on real policy solutions to the challenges facing this country versus on the other side, Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump. And Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump are flip sides of the same coin. Both of them support the same policy issues. Both Hillary and Donald support massive tax increases. Donald Trump has promises to, to impose a 40% massive tax increase, a tariff on every American who is a consumer. That policy would send us into a recession, if not a depression. I think Californians are taxed too much already. I'm going to cut your taxes and abolish the IRS. Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton both support the individual mandate in Obamacare and both have said they want to expand Obamacare into government-provided socialized health care. Here in California, the Democrats are trying to put millions of illegal aliens on Obamacare. As president, I'm going to repeal every word of Obamacare. <laughs> Donald and Hillary both supported Bill Clinton's nationwide ban on guns, many of the most popular guns in America. As president, I will defend the Second Amendment right to keep and bear arms. <laughs> Donald and Hillary both believe we should be neutral between Israel and the Palestinians. As president, I will stand with Israel. And Donald and Hillary both believe we should keep in place this Iranian nuclear deal. Just this week, Donald gave a speech, his foreign policy speech, where he said, we've got to honor the commitments made by this president. No, we don't. It wasn't passed into a treaty. It wasn't passed into a law. It is an executive agreement, and I will rip to shreds this Iranian nuclear deal on the first day in office. Clear and simple contrast 
That's what this election is about. Donald and Hillary have been Washington insiders for 40 years. Donald Trump supported Jimmy Carter over Ronald Reagan. Donald Trump has supported Harry Reid, Chuck Schumer, Nancy Pelosi. Donald Trump helped fund Nancy Pelosi and Harry Reid taking over the Congress from the Republicans, which is what passed Obamacare. And here in the great state of California, Donald Trump has given $12,000 to Jerry Brown, Gavin Newsom, and Cav Kamala Harris. Now, y'all are experiencing firsthand the consequences of those misguided liberal policies. This election is about choices. And we are campaigning, asking for your support. We are working to unite the party. This election is about unity. If we're fractured, if we're divided, Hillary Clinton wins and the country is lost. And so Carly and I are campaigning. Heidi and I and the girls are campaigning across the state of California, asking that we come together and we stand united. You know, it was 1957 that my father fled Cuba. When my dad came to America, he was just 18 years old. He was penniless. Had $100 sewn into his underwear. Couldn't speak English. And he washed dishes making 50 cents an hour. Paid his way through school, went on to start a small business. Today, my dad is a pastor. Now, my father's story is the story of everyone here. It is the story of America. Every one of us, we are the children of those who risked everything for freedom. I think that is the most fundamental DNA of what it means to be an American, that we value freedom and opportunity above all else. That's the mighty California spirit that built this state into such an incredible economic engine that you have survived and thrived in the face of democratic mismanagement year after year after year. But when I was a kid, my dad used to say to me over and over again, when we faced oppression in Cuba... I had a place to flee to. If we lose our freedom here, where do we go? That is why all of us are here. So at the end of this long primary battle, the entire country is going to look to the state of California to decide which path do we go down. Do we do go down the path of a campaign that is based on yelling and screaming and cursing and insults? It's a good answer. <laughs> or do we unite behind a positive, optimistic, forward-looking campaign? And if we unite, we will win this primary, we will win the general, we will beat Hillary Clinton, and we will turn this country around. It took... Jimmy Carter, to give us Ronald Reagan. And the Reagan Revolution began here in the great state of California. I am convinced the most long-lasting legacy of Barack Obama is going to be a new generation of leaders in the Republican Party who stand and fight for liberty, who stand and fight for the Constitution, and who stand and fight for the Judeo-Christian values that built this great nation. Thank you, and God bless you.